विष्णुपाद परमहंस परिग्रह आचार्यस्तुतेर शत श्री श्रीमाधि सिवाइंगेस अभय चरणारविंद बाकी वेरांत शामी स्वीला प्रभु पाद की जाय ओम विष्णुपाद परमहंस परिग्रह आचार्यस्तुतेर शत श्री श्रीमाधि सिवाइंगेस सिला भक्ति शिक्षण सुशर्ष दिगोष्ठामी महाराज को भाज की जय अनंत कोटि बाईशन अप्रिंद की जय स्कांड बीबीजी फंग अचार्य जस्सिलो को भाज की जय नाम अचार्य सिला हरिदास ठाकुर की जय कम से कम श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु ने ठान अंदर्शिर धोई तेरे दांधार श्री बाष्ट दिगावर भक्त अप्रिंद की जय श्री राधा कृष्ण गोपको श्रीमद्भागवत धाम कीजिए, श्रीमाया पौर्णमति धाम कीजिए, गंगा माई कीजिए, जमुन माई कीजिए, भक्ति देवी कीजिए, भक्ति देवी कीजिए, शामा वेथा भक्त ब्रिंद कीजिए, हाय गो प्रेमानंदी, आप ग्लोरी स्तुति समुदी बोलते, आप ग्लोरी स्तुति समुदी, आप ग्लोरी स्तुति समुदी, आप ग्लोरी तू सी गुरु एंड गोरो, श्री माते भक्ति वेदांत शामनी तिनावने नमस्ते शरुषुति देवे गोपुरवाने विशेष संज्ञवाने पुष्चाते ओम नमो भगवते वाशुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वाशुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वाशुदेवाया भगवते भाषुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते भाषुदेवाया We're reading from the first canto, fifteenth chapter, titled "The Pandavas Retire Timely," and we're reading from text thirty-five. Yata. Matsya Adi Rupani Dhate Jayat Yatha Nataha Bhubharaha Shupitaha Chapitaha Jena Jaha Tatcha Kalevaram Yatamatsyadi Rupani Tatejaya Yatanataha Bhubhara Chapito Jena Chaho Tatcha Kalevaram Yatamatsyadi Rupani Tatejayad Yatanataha Bhubhara Chapito Jena Chaho Chacha Kalevaram Yata Matsyadi Rupani Tate Jaya Yata Nataha Bhubhara Chapito Jena Chaho Chacha Kalevaram Yatha Matsyadi Rupani Dhatte Jaya Jitanataha Bhubhara Chapito Jena Jaha Chachat Kalevaram You guys are too humble. Somebody needs to be aggressive here. Follow around. You chant. Yatha Matsyari Rupani. Yatha Matsyari Rupani. Dathe Jaha. Dathe Jaya Jitanataha. Dathe Jaya Jitanataha. Bhubhara Chapito Yena. Bhubhara Chapito Yena. Jaha Tachakko 
Word meaning, Jatha, as much as, Matsya Adi, incarnation as a fish, etc. Rupani, forms, Dhate, eternally accepts, Jayat, apparently relinquishes. Yatha, exactly like, exactly like. Nataha, Nataha. Magician. magician, Bhubharaha, Bhubharaha. Burden, of the world. burden of the world, Chapitaha, Chapitaha. relieved, Relieve. Jena. Jena, by which, by which. Jaha. Jaha. let go, let go. Tat. 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 that, that. Cha. Cha. also, also. Kalevaram. Kalevaram. body. body. Translation. The Supreme Lord relinquished the body which he manifested to diminish the burden of the earth. Just like a musician, he relinquishes one body to accept different ones, like the fish incarnation and others. So we can repeat. The Supreme Lord relinquished the body which he manifested to diminish the burden of the earth. He did, <laughs> he did leave to diminish the burden of the earth. He relinquished the body. The way I broke the sentence up sounds like he left to diminish. Supreme Lord relinquished the body which he manifested to diminish the burden of the earth. Just like a magician, like a magician. he relinquishes one body, relinquishes one body to, accept different ones. to accept different ones, like the fish incarnation and others. Like the fish incarnation. The Supreme Lord, Personality of God, is neither impersonal nor formless, but his body is non different from him, and therefore he is known as the embodiment of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. In the Brihad Vaishnava Tantra, it is clearly mentioned that anyone who considers the form of Lord Krishna to be made of material energy must be ostracized by all means. Does that mean... Um, you put them in an osterizer? Don't You're out of the, uh, you don't get qualified as a bona fide knowledge. You're out of Vedic culture. Um, and if by chance the face of such an infidel is seen, one must clean himself by jumping in the river with his clothing. So in Krishna consciousness, we also have infidels. Now we know what a Krishna, what a, in Krishna consciousness, is, what an infidel is. Anyone who thinks the Lord is impersonal or formless? Infidel really means he's, yeah, really not even considered cultured. But anyway, he's an infidel. But we won't kill him will ostracize the contamination from his heart and make him a devotee. We'll put him in the Krishna conscious ostracizer. And we'll pull out the uh, poison. The Lord is described as amrita, or deathless, because he has no material body. Under the circumstances, the Lord, the Lord's dying or quitting his body is like the jugglery of a magician. The magician shows by his tricks that he is cut to pieces, burnt to ashes, are made unconscious by hypnotic influence. But all the false shows, but all, all, but all are false shows. So this is actually for Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. He gives the example that once 
in the court, the king came and he did his magic and it appeared that the king's, many of the children or family members had actually died. And then three days later he brought them back. It appeared that he had, um, yeah, so many people had died. So he's saying it's just magic, Krishna's magic. It appears like he's dying. But only to those who are fooled. Actually, the magician himself is neither burnt to ashes nor cut to pieces, nor is he dead or unconscious at any stage of his magical demonstration. Similarly, the Lord has his eternal forms of unlimited variety, of which the fish incarnation, as was exhibited within this universe, is also one. Because there are innumerable universes somewhere or other, the fish incarnation must be manifesting his pastimes without cessation. In this verse, the particular word pate, eternally accepted, and not the word ditva, accepted for the occasion, is used. The idea is that the Lord does not create the fish incarnation. He eternally has such a form, and the appearance and disappearance of such an incarnation serves particular purposes. In the Bhagavad Gita 7, 24 and 25, the Lord says, the impersonalists think that I have no form, that I am formless, but that at present I have accepted a form to serve a purpose, and now I am manifest. But such speculators are factually without sharp intelligence. Actually, doesn't the verse say, Abudaya, no intelligence? Not, not, this is a compliment. Verse actually says, <laughs> No, is that the first question? Oh, yeah. Manyate mam ahabudhaya. I have no intelligence. Manyate mam. Ones who think that I have taken from a formless, the form has come and manifest, they are a Buddha. They didn't pass the test. Um, Though they may be good scholars in the Vedic literatures, they are practically ignorant of my inconceivable energies and my eternal forms of personality. This is amazing. They may know the Shastras better than we know them. They can quote the shlokas, they can do the samskaras, they can do it all. They can run circles around us, and they don't know that Krishna's God. Just like I tell my daughter, she's my daughter's 13, she goes to school in Mayapur, so she's they have mantra class every day with Bhakti Vidyapur and Swami. So they learn all the mantras and how to chant them. Om Purnam Ara Purnam Idam Purnam Purnam Udatyate. They learn it all. And uh, learn so many things about culture. And I said, you know more than all the professors, all the Indologists and uh, professors of philosophy. You're much smarter than them. It's true, isn't it? As I said last night, I had a philosophy professor who on the first day of class, of course this was Berkeley 1969, kind of crazy, first day of class, he said, I don't know anything, so there's no need to come to my class. <laughs> At least he was honest. Right? What's the point? I mean, you're already in yeah. no, Then he said, just write a paper, give yourself a grade, turn it in. <laughs> so, that's what we did. But at least he was honest. You know that conversation as Prabhupada um, met a professor of Hinduism and he said, what's Hinduism? The professor said, I don't know. It's a complicated topic. He said, you're a professor. You don't know. And then he turned to Sri Dhamma and said, he's a professor of Hinduism. He doesn't know what Hinduism What is that? What does that mean? Sri Dhamma Maharaj said, Prabhupada, that means he's a cheater. They didn't probably say something. He's called you a cheater. <laughs> well, are you going to take that? <laughs> anyway, the man got really upset. But Ravinda Prabhu said, like, he met the man like 20 years later. And he said, yeah, actually your guru was right. <laughs> it's true. My daughter knows more than him. The less intelligent fools are therefore unaware of my eternal form, which is never to be vanquished and is unborn. That's the verse. They don't know my higher nature. They can't know it. They don't want to know it. 
In the Bhagavan, it is said that those who are envious and always angry at the Lord are unfit to know the actual and eternal form of the Lord. So that explains it. They're not qualified. In the Bhagavatam also it is said that the Lord appeared like a thunderbolt to those who were restless. Shishupal at the time of being killed by the Lord could not see him as Krishna, being dazzled by the glare of the Brahmachoti. Therefore, the temporary manifestation of the Lord as a thunderbolt to the wrestlers appointed by Kamsa or the glaring appearance of the Lord before Shishupal was relinquished by the Lord. The Lord, but the Lord as a magician is eternally existent and is never vanquished in any circumstance. Such forms are temporarily shown to the asuras only and when such exhi- exhibitions are withdrawn the asuras think that the Lord is no more existent. Just as the foolish audience thinks the magician to be burnt to ashes or cut to pieces. The conclusion is that the Lord has no material body and therefore is never to be killed or changed by his transcendental body. One of the most interesting things about Krishna's appearance is that, or everything Krishna does, in one sense, because people want to see him as material, so in that sense, he manifests his pastimes in a way that they're completely bewildered and they just think he's ordinary or they think he's come from Brahman. So when Krishna left, he was apparently killed by a hunter. So if he's killed, that means he has a material body and he's an ordinary person. And that Krishna said, you want to see me as an ordinary person? Okay, let's go. It's gonna, I'm going to appear like I just got shot and died. And I have an ordinary physical form. Or, you want to see me as impersonal? Okay, we'll show you that. Whatever you want, we'll show you. You get what you ask for. That's how Krishna works. <clears throat> and you want to see me as sweet and loving, the darling of Jasoda, then I'll show you that. So, that's Krishna. Nidhita Mahaprabhupada, whatever you want, you're going to get. And Krishna's really good at it. So if you want to be bewildered by him, he's really good at bewildering. Look at he's got all the he's got all the philosophers and scholars completely bewildered. They we have scholars that study this stuff. They do PhDs in this in Leela and Rasa and Tatva and all this stuff. They have no idea what's going on. And they can talk circles around this, quoting verses and shastras and Establishing tattva and speculating, and they have no idea who Krishna is. They talk about him. So now we're we're reading about Krishna's disappearance and how he had to wind up his pastimes. He was his business was finished. He wound up the pastimes of the. Pandavas of the Jada dynasty, and um, and at this time, Yudhisthira and the Pandavas they also were leaving. Everybody was leaving, and his la- and so Krishna gives his, gives his last kick to the impersonalist and atheist. Okay, I'll just die like ordinary person. Interesting, isn't it? Because you you would think, I mean, you might think. Well, if you were God, you know, you want to make a nice exit, you know, make a final exit to show that I'm actually God, you know. Really, I am. Like, I'm going to do something super. You know, manifest a big light, you know. Something amazing is going to happen, and then I'm going to merge and, you know, into my something or other. Do something, you know, special, so everybody could see it. But then you could say, well, look at it. Krishna shows the universal form. But that didn't seem to work because nobody saw it. They couldn't see it. Just like um, Tim Prabhupada said, well, Krishna was here and nobody understood who he was. And he was doing all these amazing things. And maybe a few people understood. So, even if Krishna shows it, do people understand it? Did everyone understand Prabhupada? No. 
kind of amazing, isn't it? Now, most devotees think, if I could just see Krishna, everything would be good. Right? All material desires will go. Right? I'll be on the path. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said that actually you don't see Krishna like that. Because you can't see Krishna with anything other than the mood of bhakti. Otherwise, if you see him, you have the mood of bhakti, you're not actually able to see him. That's why people couldn't see him. So, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when we take darshan, at least according to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Krishna's taking darshan of us. He's seeing us because he's the enjoyer. So he enjoys us. So that's the mood. You go in front of the deity. And you think, well, how could Krishna enjoy me? But that's the mood because you're to be enjoyed by Krishna. You and me and all of us, we're all Prakriti in Krishna's Purusha. So we go in front of the deity as Prakriti. Not to see or enjoy Krishna, but for Krishna to enjoy us. Same with the holy name. It's not that we're singing because we like to sing, we're singing as an offering to Krishna. You offer boga to Krishna, it's the same thing, it's all for his enjoyment. We're enjoyed, so he likes looking at us. And that's how you see Krishna. You get a glimpse by being in that mood of, of him enjoying. But if any, if any way you look at Krishna as uh, in the Purusha mood, as the enjoyer, then you don't see him. Right? And that's why when people first come to the temple, they don't realize there's anything on the altar other than flowers. Isn't it? They, can't even, they don't know there's deities on the altar. Most, I don't know, if you notice it when you first came here, but most people don't really notice what's up there until they're a little more purified. You have that experience when you first came here? Did you see anything on the altar? Most of what he's telling me they didn't. And as you, obviously as you become Krishna conscious, when you look, the deities become more beautiful. And Prabhupada would say when he was a young boy, he would they had family deities, and he would go to the temple and he would stand and look at the deities for hours, fixed. So what was he seeing? Right? Sure Say hours. Just stand. We just stand and stare at the beauty of the deities. Right. And if you brought some tour group and showed them the deities, then what would they see? We're going to get the same thing. So, so that way we understand that so many people saw Krishna and they're thinking, how could they not see anything? That's how. Like uh, our friend, the gorilla, or the bear, Chambhava, he didn't see he didn't understand it was Krishna. He was angry. Naham prakashya sarvasya yoga maya samandita. So, I'm co- Krishna's covered. So it's interesting that, you know, Krishna didn't, he, he leaves and he doesn't make an effort to go, look, this is my final act, you know. I'm actually God, you know. I mean, I lived to go over down hill, you didn't get it. You know, I killed all these demons, you didn't get it. I did all these things, you didn't get it, so let me do like my final act, so maybe you'll get it. You know? But he didn't do it. He disappeared like an ordinary person, to be well with you. <laughs> you, can't, you, you can't get it without bhakti. You know? But then Mahaprabhu says, Mahaprabhu, he does the final act. He goes, no, it's, it's not working this way. You know, Surrender and all that stuff, it's not working, nobody's doing it. You know? And that's the only way they're going to understand this. So let's just bypass that. We'll just, you know, we'll change the rules. And so then he comes, changes all the rules. Just go here, and just take it. You guys are useless. You, you couldn't get it when I came here. You couldn't figure it out. And now, you know, 5,000 years later, we got all these scholars, you know, we can quote every shloka in the universe, and they can't figure it out. So let's just, you know, you guys are hopeless. Mercy case. Let's just, let's just do it this way. Here, just take this maha mantra. Chant it, and everything will be fine. Just take it. You, know. you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to have any faith practically. You just chant it, see what happens. Right? We read this morning. That was an early lecture. That's what Prabhupada was doing. He's, he's, he, Prabhupada was a salesman. Doesn't cost anything. What, what do you say? You don't have to pay tax on it. You can do it anywhere. It might work. Why not try it? You know? Like, that's Mahaprabhu. Right? <laughs> just like. 
here, you know. No qualification. The Prabhupada said, in Vedic times, if you weren't Brahmin, if you didn't have Upanayana for medical initiation, no, the women, the girl wouldn't even give you the time of day. They're useless. You have to be qualified even here. You can't chant these Vedic mantras unless you're wearing a thread and you've been initiated. So, you know, forget it for the mass of people. And then Mahaprabhu goes, Look at here. This mantra is just better than all these other Vedic mantras, and you don't have to be initiating. Just anyone on the street, hey, come over here. Look at this mantra. Can you chant it? I got it. No problem. So that's what's going on. So that's what Mahaprabhu said. Krishna looked at his program and said, it really didn't work. You know, I say I'm God, and they say the unborn is in you is God. And it just didn't work. I didn't get it. It's called you, the, the brain's not working. Nobody wants to surrender to God. And every philosophy out there is just another way to avoid surrender. That's why you think, why do they read I am God and they come up with something? It's the inborn within you, the unborn within you is God. How did they figure that one out? Well, if you don't want to surrender to God, you've got to come up with something. Right? So that all these ideas just to like prevent, prevent us from actually having to surrender to God. Hey, and we can be God. That's even better. Not surrendering is pretty good, but becoming God, that's a lot better. Right? So then every philosophy out there just to avoid. Right? I mean, you're in San Diego, you know. People are very eclectic, you know. Little this, little that, you know. Everything but surrender, right? Isn't it? It's all about feeling good, being in the whatever, you know, whatever they say these days. Being in the pause. Is that the latest one? being the Bob. <laughs> it's all about avoiding surrender. That's why all those people aren't so happy, you know, you know, to hear a lecture about surrender. You know? They don't really want to hear that. It's not fun. So, Mahaprabhu comes and he sets everything right and uh, Everything's good. Now, interesting thing happened when Krishna left the planet. All the signs of Kali Yuga manifested, and, and Yudhisthira was seeing them. And Arjuna had, Arjuna had gone to see Krishna. He'd be gone. He'd been gone seven months, and he hadn't come back. But while he was gone, signs of uh, Huge changes in society, like people started cheating and lying. And they, they became very much concerned about material things and money. And it, was, it wasn't like that before. It was like, you know how when we were young, when we were young, which means you guys were old in, in the last life, so maybe you experienced it but can't remember it. But we witnessed a huge change in society, in at least San Francisco, California, New York, 1965, some other places. Major, like, all the kids, just, you know, all these nice kids from nice families started taking LSD and walking around like this. And dropping out, and, you know, they all could have been doctors and lawyers and CEOs. And, <laughs> you know, and then having sex, you know, ten times a day. And it's just like, complete change. Just like, major, you know. What? Like, it was in like six months or a year, it was like, I have all my friends, you know, I'm, I'm smoking pot and all that. Oh, don't do that, that's bad. You know, the next year they're all doing it more than me. You know, it's just like... So, something like that. And here, you know, Dwar Dwapara Yuga, everything's nice. And all of a sudden, people are lying, they're cheating, they're becoming greedy, it's all about money. This is what Yudhisthira saw. So, he started putting two and two together. So, this Kali Yuga has come, that must mean... Krishna has left. And there were all these inauspicious omens, blood raining from the sky, blood and pus, I believe. You ever seen that? Blood and pus raining from the sky. Yes. Dogs are barking, jackals are howling, so many things. So when Krishna left, Kali Yuga entered. Isn't that amazing? He does all his leelas, he speaks Bhagavad Gita, and then he leaves, and boom, Kali Yuga comes. But, 
Bhagavatam is an incarnation of Krishna, and his holy name is the incarnation of Krishna. In Kali Yuga, Kali Kali, what's the verse? Kali Kali. Kali Kali, Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. Yeah. In Kali Yuga, Krishna's name and Bhagavatam. And here we're talking about Krishna left. You know, so when you leave, there's separation. But there's really not separation because he left, but he left his Leela. And Prabhupada said his Leela is him. And he left his name. So we don't really feel separation. Do we? Not so much. Of course, how do you feel separation unless you've met him? So you have to meet him and have some love before you can feel separation. But still, for us, we have shelter in his name. So, although he left, we're okay. We take solace in hearing and chanting. So, this purport is interesting because... Prabhupada doesn't really talk much about Krishna leaving. He just talks about his transcendental form and Mayavad philosophy. Right? Isn't basically the whole and how people misunderstand Krishna to think in material. Why is he spending so much time on that? Because that's what's going on out there. Everyone is, uh, as Trivita and I were discussing, I don't know, as Yudhishthira and I were discussing, that there's so many Mayavadis, they don't even know they're Mayavadis. Right? Impersonal. It's, just, it's so pervasive, they don't even know what it is. They're like, oh, I don't talk to him, he's an impersonalist. Yeah, he is, but he doesn't even know what impersonalism is. He's just, you know, that's the fashion. You know. We're all one, and, you know, because every... Every guru you listen to, we're all one, and I'm you, and you're me, and unity, and the light. And, right? Southern California is good at that, isn't it? And there's people, they don't know, they don't really know what they're talking about, but still, Prabhupada is aware that this is going on, and this is the battle we're fighting with, in spreading Krishna consciousness. So, his whole purport. That's all he's talking about, Right? Because it's so important. So, Prabhupada got criticized. He said, everywhere, Krishna. In your books, you know, it doesn't say Krishna in the verse, and you're putting in Krishna. In your purport. Or you're putting Krishna in the verse. It didn't even say Krishna. And you're putting Krishna all over your books. The Rasha Rasha, he told the story. I think he was here years ago, told the story. He was on a plane, in, I guess in India, next to some man. They were talking about Bhagavad Gita. And, and he, this man had a Bhagavad Gita of some other guru. So the man saying, well, what's the difference between your Gita and my Gita? He said, give me your Gita. He went through the whole Gita. The name Krishna was not mentioned one time. Not one. And he said, look at my Gita. How many times the name Krishna is mentioned? And look at your Gita. It's not mentioned once. The man needs to be understood. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So Prabhupada, he understood what's going on. They're trying to kill Krishna through philosophy, through knowledge, so-called science. He understood it clearly. And therefore, he's putting Krishna everywhere. Krishna, look at how many times. Krishna has a form, he's not impersonal. Fools think he's impersonal. On and on and on and on and on again. 1972, whenever it was, in Los Angeles, the prophet started talking about the sciences. Completely out of the blue. He never, we never even heard him talk about scientists. And now he's like, these rascal scientists! <laughs> and every morning, you know, we're, we're in Los Angeles. What's going on here? What did the scientists do? Are they poisoning the water? Or, you know, what's going on? We had no idea. Every morning. The tenth prophet, he gives a lecture, he goes, the greatest enemies of human civilization, the scientists. My uncle Charlie's a scientist. He was, he's a nice guy. You know. Greatest enemy of human civilization. They're totally bewildered. But 
that Prophet understood these, they're becoming the gurus. They're going to lead the movement of atheism, of voidism. So he was so upset. And he, well, I was in San Francisco. And Prophet, it was at Raj Yatra time, and Prophet had spoken to a scientist, and the next morning he said, we had spoken to some scientists, and I called him a rascal. And Prophet said, and he accepted. <laughs> that, you know, a Prophet didn't mince words with these people. He just, he just told them, that's what you are. You are an enemy. Because there is God, and you're trying to disprove him with your theories, with your knowledge, or turn him into a, a void light. He was very, very angry. As, as we said, out of his love, he, becomes, he became angry. Out of his love for Krishna, he became angry when people would try to annihilate Krishna with their philosophy. So therefore, we see Prabhupada always, always, always speaking against him personally. Out of love for Krishna. And establishing the tattva, the truth. You have two things. You have tattva and you have rasa. And so tattva means truth and rasa means relationship. So here, Prabhupada has to spend so much time establishing the tattva of what God is because nobody knows. Do they? I mean, if you had to take a test on what God is, would you pass before you were devoted? What would you say? God is everything. Got yourself covered, right? That should cover the answer. God is everything. Um, yeah. That's half the answer. But Mahaprabhu came and said, yeah, God is everything and he's not everything. Simultaneously. He's one with everything. Yeah. That's the perfection of philosophy, right? He's everything and he's a person. He's outside of everything. Achintya. Veda Veda Tattva. We have it. Prabhupada gave it to us. Mahaprabhu gave it to us. Nobody, is, nobody understands this. So, Prabhupada is giving, giving, giving. Krishna, 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 Krishna. Why Krishna? Why Krishna? Krishna Prabhupada said to me, what did he say? They want, what did he say? Like they want to create Krishna a disease. You have Krishna. Krishna, I just, just Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. You need it. Another interesting thing about Krishna's disappearance, which is which is different from the disappearance of the guru or the sadhu, but it's elsewhere Prabhupada writes that the devotees are not really they don't really like talking about Krishna's disappearance. It's not pleasant. But the disappearance of the sadhu is different. And I don't know if you know this, but traditionally in Gaudi of Vaishnava society, the appearance days of the sadhus were not celebrated, but the, the disappearance days were celebrated and the reasoning was, the, the concept is when they appear, their leelas haven't been manifest, their pastimes and activities haven't been manifest, but their disappearance signifies, well, they've lived their entire life. Now you have the whole history of their life to glorify. And it was always a festival of celebration. Okay, now he's lived this glorious life and we celebrate it. And through that Kata, we become inspired. So, um, there was never this concept as the Vaishnavas left, because he always left his pastimes and he left his instructions, and we celebrate them. And Prabhupada said, I never felt separated from my spiritual master. In fact, one time in 1970, Prabhupada came to San Francisco and the temple had rooms, I don't know, maybe. Not even half this. What? Fred? No, Frederick. Frederick was like half this size, I don't know. Yeah, it's probably like half this size. Not even half. Like take half the temple and knock off like a quarter in the back. That was about how big it was. So, all the devotees, were, we didn't meet Prabhupada at the airport, but we all waited for him in the temple. And so we all got in the temple and we were all standing or on their knees or something. But it was all brahmacharis. 
like just packed, like hundred, hundred, hundred of us, whatever. But you have to understand, at that time in the movement, there were only <coughs> 17 temples in the whole movement. And the average temple had like eight devotees. So there weren't a lot of devotees. You know, so maybe like a hundred, you know, like most of the devotees, or half of them, were there at Rathi Atra. So, every devotee was in, we wear these polyester dhotis. So you don't dye them, they come with the color. So they're, you know, they're very effulgent. They don't fade. So we were all very effulgent, and everyone had shaved their heads, put on tilak. Then Prabhupada came, and he just, he didn't come into the temple. He stopped at the door, and he was just looking. And, and I think it's because this was the largest number of brahmacharis assembled in one place, and he was just beaming. And he just stopped and looked, and didn't come in for a while. And then later, Prabhupada revealed, he said, that when I saw all the devotees, I stopped because I wanted to call my Guru Maharaj to come look. That's what he did. So Guru Maharaj come look. So he, Prabhupada said, I never felt separated from my spiritual master. And then he came in, he sat on the Vyasa Sun, and he chanted the Guru Vashtaka. Because he was meditating on his spiritual master. He just called him to see him. Look at Guru Maharaj, the movement is succeeding. We have Brahmacharya. That's the impression I got. It was like, okay, it's actually happening now. And he called him to see. So that's that's how the devotee feels. So it never really feels separation. But concept of Krishna leaving is is for the devotee, and, you know, we, we want to discuss the leavers, not the departure. So that that's my prophet makes that point, but as far as we're concerned in terms of the leelas of Srila Prabhupada, they're eternally there, and we feel eternally connected by remembering them and his instruction. So we never, in that sense, lament or feel separation. We feel happy. Like on Prabhupada's disappearance day. It's a disappearance day, but it's blissful, isn't it? Because everyone's telling stories, and everybody's laughing and becoming inspired. Right, and we're feasting and having kirtan. And I always, I would always think on Prabhupada's disappearance day. You know, we, we, we'd all be solemn, and Prabhupada's disappeared, and we're doing the pushpanjali, and we're doing the guru puja, we're having kirtan. But by the end of kirtan, everybody's dancing, and something in my mind says, "Why are we all dancing? It's a disappearance day. Yeah, we should be dressed in black, lamenting. You know, maybe we should just sit down, and chant Jayani Lo Premadana." pound our head on the floor and cry. No, but it's never like that. Right? We're dancing blissfully, we're sharing Prabhupada's pastimes. So our concept of disappearance is, is that he's there. And in the transcendental realm, separation is only there to increase ecstasy. So it's not like ordinary separation, lamentation. At the airport, you don't distribute books at the airport? Not allowed. So we used to distribute books at the airport. So airport is a place of meeting and separation. Either people are coming in and you meet them, or they're leaving and they're going out. So there are always these very happy scenes of meeting and very depressed scenes of separation. The military men are going off and their wives. So, separation is much more intense, emotion. So, in Krishna's pastimes and leelas, he arranges for there to be separation. But it's different. It increases ecstasy. That's all. So, it's different. It's totally different. So, when we um, discuss separation from Krishna, or Krishna does leelas to be separated from his devotees. It's, it's just intensifying the loving feelings of the devotees. Sometimes Radharani even feels separation from Krishna, thinking that he'll be separated, or thinking that he's gone, being bewildered, and he's right there. It increases ecstasy. So. Krishna is nice, right? Because you really can't be separated. And if you think you are, you just become more ecstatic and you become closer. 
And then you chant his name, and there he is, right there with you. Isn't that nice? So you can never be separated. When you talk about him, he's there. Never mind devotees. I don't live in my kunta. I, I don't live in the hearts of the yogis. I live in my devotees are doing kata. So Krishna is so nice that he allows himself to appear to us. So we never really feel separation in that sense, materially. But if we feel separation, that's a very high level of ecstasy. Which we aspire for. That's one of our aspirations. But don't worry about it yet. It'll, hopefully it will come someday. But that's an ecstasy. So, cool. time flies and you're having fun. Any questions, comments? Yes. My question would be, um, I was here um, about a month ago, and I put it in the time to do it, and then it was also, you know, I'm here now, I'm in my life, and so my question would be, is this the ISIS, uh, you know, try to prove that this is not in person? There are Christians who are, you know, trying to prove <laughs> But the Christians don't believe in Krishna. But they're trying to prove, yeah, there are. But it's not good for your career if you are. It's not much appreciated. Career, career-wise, you could get fired for trying to prove that God exists. There's science. It's not popular. It's not. That's not the way the world's going right now. That's the problem. As documented by Druda Karma, many people lost their jobs presenting evidence that is contrary to what modern science believes. But obviously there's many theists who are scientists. But it's just not popular now. And it's not popular in textbooks. As far as I understand, the textbooks may make mention that uh, creation is a possible theory. That God created as a possible theory, but most of the text is dedicated to other theories, scientific theories of creation. I don't know what the latest one is now, if they're still on neo-Darwinism or they've come up with something else. They're always coming up with something, right? But still, did they ever come? Did they come back to God yet? Or they're still out there? Exploring, you know, other alternatives to God. That's my understanding. But it's the same idea, you know, anything but God. But, you know, some of them say, you know, they, they go around in a complete circle and say, I, I can't. I, I've gone everywhere and uh, I've come back to God. It's the only explanation. So the pious ones will come to that. The Prabhupada said in a letter once, he said, No, you can only, people could, the public can only be cheated for so long before they just lose faith. Yes, Professor, what's the latest theories out there? I haven't been up on it. First question When did the temple move from Frederick Street to the Lancaster? Do you know that? It moved around 71. Maybe late 70s. That's the first place I saw that he was at the night stage. There's something interesting, of course, about the scientists. Uh, it was one of the most startling pieces of information I had had in 22 years of practice in medicine. I was there about six months ago. It came out that the 20-year editor of the New England Journal of Medicine came out with a major statement. And you can Google this. That, and I'm paraphrasing. In essence, she said, uh, all of our research and all of the uh, information we've been giving the public really is practically worthless. That was her statement because everything is so skewed by uh, conflict of interest, money put in from pharmaceutical companies and universities. And she said, I have to resign. I can't support this anymore. I was in a meeting at UCSD at the time when I brought this up, and me always being the odd man out. I said, why haven't we heard about this on the news? Why isn't this all over TV? I mean, this is earth shattering. They're saying our research, the, the editor of, of New England Journal is saying it's no good. And one of the other doctors popped across the, uh, the table in our conference room the front page of the New York Times or something there it was. Oh, 
wow. I mean, that's, uh, but of course, that was it. 